Hello and welcome to today's Trade Plates TV live show. We have taken over logistics, you can't see, but we've transformed their boardroom into a studio. And today you get to see the people that normally come through the screen um, are sat in front of you. We've got Howard Tilney, Nona Bocas, Bar Bocas? I said it right and that's the thing that gets in my head there, it's wrong. <laughs> Jason Williams and all three of these are legal advisors and then we've got Ian Gardner who's sales manager aka the judge but he's not worn his wig which I'm really disappointed about. Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so guys thank you very much for taking time out today to have a chat with us. I know you're all very, very busy at the moment. Um, so we've got a few questions which have been pinched from the forum and have been sent in by you guys at home. But if you want to ask anything else today and try and put these guys on the spot, if you look below the screen now, <laughs> then, <laughs> no one <said> this. <laughs> there's a little chat box and you can let us know um, any of your questions or just say hello, give your opinions. Um, if you have any feedback on the stuff that's said or more questions from them. I'm going to be watching the screen and I'm going to be keeping an eye on our Twitter feed, which is at Trade Plates TV as well, so you can send things over there too. Um, so I'm going to kick off with something um, which seems to come up again and again. Um, advertising laws, very complicated. But are there any that you guys see that, like mistakes that dealers keep making again and again? I don't know about keep making, oh, okay. but we do see some examples which should be avoided. Uh, and I've chosen five. Mm. Uh, the first of which is rounding down mileages. If the car that's being advertised has got 84,800 miles on the clock, mm. don't advertise as having 84,000 miles. Because it's very tempting to do that, but inevitably when the consumer buys the car and they say, you've advertised at 80,000, 84,000 miles, when I take it, it's got 84,800 miles on it, they're going to come back to you and say, well, it's not described properly. So don't round down the mileages just to have a nice round number if you can, give a precise mileage reading. Uh, we accept that from time to time those mileages will increase when the consumer buys the car mm. because people have gone on test drives or it's gone for an MOT or, or something like that. Uh, but do put the exact mileage down. Uh, don't be tempted to, to round those mileages down to a nice convenient number because it will get you into trouble when the consumer picks up their car and it's got more, mileages on, more mileage on it than it has when you've advertised it. One way around that as well is to put somewhere on the advert, if you can, information correct as of so-and-so date, mm. so that if the car does have increased mileage because of a test drive, then you can always say, well, that was the mileage on the date that we, we advertised it. So there's no onus on the customer to confirm that these things are correct. They can buy it and then come back the, to you. The, the difficulty is that they'll go to training standards and they'll say, well, this car's not to describe. I didn't want to pay any more money for this car I only wanted 84,000 was my absolute most I wanted to have on this car. And I didn't want a car with a single mile more than that. And they've misled me. Mm. I would never have come to the showroom and seen this car if I'd known the exact mileage on it. And believe me, they exactly. do it. They, they do it because they want to try and get some discount. So it just obviously makes it more easy. It just makes it easier mm. if you can just give the precise mileage reading wherever possible. That's something I always think that there's going to be test drives that will be a bit more than it's advertised. But uh, precisely. But I think you know if you have, if if you've got a car say which is you know much closer to say eighty five thousand eighty four thousand, you're not going to have eight hundred miles of test drive on it. Mm. You know. <laughs> so we can accept that there will be slightly higher mileage, and we can argue that. Mm. But it's very difficult to argue it when it's eight or nine hundred miles more than when it was advertised. So it is just best to give the exact mileage and then simply say, somewhere on the advert, all information correct as of whichever date you advertise it. Do you actually deal with things like that quite a lot? Oh, right? all the time, yeah. yes. Oh, you always really? get people saying it's not as described, you know, the mileage is, we had someone saying the other day, I, I want my money back because the car's done 198 miles more than it was, <laughs> it was advertised at. You well, know, we can argue that because we can say it's been on test drives, gone for mm -hmm. an MOT, uh, gone for some repairs or whatever, but when it's eight or nine hundred miles different, then it becomes uh, a bit more, bit more difficult to try and uh, put that argument forward. Mm. Is there anything else like that that crops up again? Insofar as descriptions are concerned, it's very important when you're describing what features that the car may have, right. because you may say, on oh, it's got this feature, that feature, the other, and then you're relying on pre-populated information given by a website uh, in relation to the, the registration number. You can put a disclaimer on there to say, along the lines that, you know, uh, you must check yourself that these features are actually on the car that you're looking to buy, and you must check with the, with the vendor beforehand. Uh, but that disclaimer has to be very carefully worded. 
Uh, we had one the other day where someone was saying, you advertise this feature as having, I think it was Zen and Lights or something, uh, and the, the trader said, well, we've got a disclaimer on there. The disclaimer said, whilst every effort has been made to ensure the description is accurate, mm. well, quite frankly, any effort would have been able to see that those lights were not Zen and Lights, not mm. every effort. So we keep away from words like, whilst every effort has been made, you've just got to say, the generic features on these cars, they may not be present on the one that you're actually looking to buy. Please make sure you check with your dealer before you agree to buy it, and it has that feature on there. Right. So that's a very important uh, thing to remember, that when you're describing features of a car, they may not actually be on the vehicle that's actually in your showroom. Okay, this sort of neat leads quite nicely onto a question we've just had from Tim, hmm. or more of a sort of a comment about a personal experience that uh, his son agreed to buy a car, um, agreed to buy it based on the advertised price, yeah. but at the point of signing a £90 fee was added and it wasn't negotiable. Hmm. So should that be included in the advertising? Yes, it should do. Right. It absolutely, definitely has to be, yes. You, the person who goes and buys it must know how much they're going to pay for this particular car. Now, if they negotiate optional extras, that's entirely different. Mm. But if this, was a, if this was a compulsory fee that was added, was non-negotiable, then it has to be added on uh, and mentioned at, this, at the point of advertising. Right, OK. Uh, there's a couple of other things as well. Uh, when you're selling to consumers, sold as seen. Please don't put sold as seen. An eBay it's favor, isn't it? It's, mean, it's <laughs> meaningless sold as seen. Uh, and get, get trading stands get very excited because it gives the impression that you're trying to take away the consumer's rights if anything goes wrong with the car. Right. So we mustn't use that if you send to consumers. Similarly, if the car is sold as spares or repairs, mm. you can't be allowing someone to drive off in it. You can't allow someone to do a test drive in it because you're only intending to sell it for spares or, or repairs. Right. It has to be just that. And you should advertise the spares or repairs only. Mm. You can't just be silent on that in the advert, and then when they buy the car, write on the invoice, spares or repairs only, because mm. that's never going to wash. You mm. have to say in advance on the advert, spares or repairs only. And if you do that, you can't go test driving it, you can't allow them to drive off in it, you've got to say, you have to arrange for someone to take this vehicle on the back of a low loader mm. because it's not meant for the road, it's only for spares or repairs only. What are the repercussions on that? Sorry. Well, the repercussions on that and it is the trading standards will get very excited about it <laughs> uh, and they will say, uh, and it, it's an offence to do it, it's misleading consumers to say that this car is spares or repairs when clearly it's not. Again, it's perceived to be another way of taking away a consumer's rights mm. if something then goes wrong uh, with that vehicle. So if it is spares or repairs, advertise it as such and don't allow test drives on it. It's the okay. same with unroadworthy. They use that term uh, a lot precisely. as well, unroadworthy vehicles. Exactly. Should you leave the MOT off of those? Shouldn't well, the, the, car, the car may come into you with an MOT in the first place anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, so, but I wouldn't go re-MOTing it and say, spares or repairs only comes with a brand new MOT, <laughs> because quite clearly it's yeah. not intended for spares or repairs uh, exclusively. Um, so that's, that's something we mustn't do as well. And also, uh, this is one thing that Trading Sands also get very excited about, is if you say one previous owner, and you don't disclose, although you know it, that that previous owner was a taxi company or a hire company, yeah. they're going to come oh, okay. down on you. Right. Because they will say that it influences people to know that when they're buying a car that's been a previously a taxi mm -hmm. or a hire car, they're going to perhaps think that the, car, the person who's driving it may be a number of different people possibly, or it may not be driven as carefully mm -hmm. as it would be if it was one per private person driving the car. So that, they will say, uh, could influence the consumer's decision to buy the car, uh, knowing that it's, um, it's been a taxi beforehand uh, or a hire vehicle. So if you know that that vehicle has been uh, a taxi or uh, lent out by a, a hire company, you have an obligation as a trader to make that known at some point before the consumer goes to buy the vehicle. And we would suggest again in the advertising, being upfront is best in okay. all of these things. So basically just write what the car actually is Tell the truth. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And if people have got any questions or doubts about it, well, they can ring us and we'll tell them. Okay, perfect. Um, so my next question um, is about protecting yourself when it comes to copyright infringement. I know my thoughts, and it's something that I've seen on the Car Dealer Forum, is if you 
um, you sell a particular brand, maybe you specialise in that brand, but you don't have a franchise and you decide to use some of their branding. How does that work? Can you, can you do that? Mm-hmm. Well, um, we're talking about uh, a trademark infringement, mm. right, uh, okay. potentially, if, uh, if a uh, trader or a service centre, for example, uh, advertise that they are uh, German car specialists and they refer to certain brands, BMW, Audi, mm. etc., and if they then start using the, the logos, the, the, the trademarks of, of those companies without consent, then sometimes they can find themselves in hot water. There have been several cases uh, along those lines. BMW have pursued uh, service okay. centres before for infringing their, uh, their trademarks. Um, it's often a, a, a much used and perhaps sometimes much overused defence to suggest that uh, referring to uh, these particular marks and making uh, use of uh, particular um, uh, logos and the like um, are merely descriptive of what the trader uh, or the service centre are specialising in mm. uh, and selling. Um, but nevertheless, if a trader uses those marks without consent of the proprietor of that trademark, uh, 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 which could be, for example, BMW, but it could be uh, perhaps uh, a, uh, a franchise mm. uh, of of one of the uh, one of the, the main uh, manufacturers. Oh, I guess if you're in an area where they've got the franchise. That's right. right. If if right. you're if you're in an area where they've got where the, where there's a where there's a franchise that mm. are, are, are selling, let's say BMWs, for example, uh, uh, and then you tout yourself as as a specialist and yeah. refer to. BMWs and U's and logos, the M, <laughs> the M Sport logos, the, the BMW tricolours, the, uh, the roundel mm. uh, badge for, for BMW, um, then you could find yourself in hot water either with BMW themselves or uh, potentially with one of, the, uh, one of the local franchisees. Is that something you've ever come across? Yeah, uh, I mean, there have been, as I say, many cases uh, that have gone before the, uh, the intellectual uh, property and enterprise courts. Mm. Uh, in relation to these very matters, uh, I've singled out BMW, but you can <laughs> apply it to to other uh, to other uh, marks, of course. Mm. Um, uh, and yeah, there have been uh, several cases, and, and one recent case, which uh, where the the uh, uh, the infringing party had argued uh, that their use of these uh, trademarks was merely descriptive. That just didn't fly in in the eyes of the IP- of IPEC, and as a result. Um, the, the consequences of, of infringement can be quite, uh, quite severe uh, mm. and dramatic. Not only uh, would the, uh, the infringing party potentially have an injunction taken out against them to cease and desist the use of those, those marks that infringe the, tr- the trademark, right. um, but also they could be facing claims for damages, uh, a, a claim for uh, an account of profits that the company has made or the concern has made off the back of the infringement, uh, mm-hmm. and in addition to that, of course, costs mm. and lawyers' costs can be uh, can be dramatic. Mm. Um, uh, we've got a case on at the moment. It's not a fring- it's not an infringement case. Um, it's uh, it, it's a uh, multi-track a county court case, but that's a case involving a, a vehicle worth something in excess of one hundred twenty thousand pounds. But the costs in that case were close to sixty thousand pounds. So <laughs> if you make a mistake yeah. and if you use somebody's mark when you shouldn't mm. uh, and you're taken to task over it, it can be very, very expensive. There are also potentially criminal sanctions for, right. for the use of, the, for the use of uh, 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 these, these marks as well sometimes. So uh, any doubt whatsoever as to what you should and shouldn't be doing, it's best to seek advice. And quite often... Um, it's a good idea to seek specialist advice, particularly when we're talking about intellectual property, okay. which, is, which is the area of law we're, we're discussing here when we're talking about trademark infringement, infringements. And that would involve going to perhaps somebody like a, um, uh, a trademark attorney or a specialist intellectual property barrister. They're all over the country, but some of the best are in, are in London, as you might expect. Mm. Uh, but again, uh, comes at a price. Yeah. So, uh, but it, if, if there's any doubt at all that, uh, that you could be infringing somebody's trademark, it's really better to invest a bit, a bit of money in it and get it checked out properly first. Right. Obviously, the first port of call is to have a chat with us, see if we can help you with it. But mm. uh, 
it may well be because it's such a, spe a specialist area of law. I can imagine that gets very complicated. It can get very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. and you really need to be dealing with those things all the time to, to know what all the very latest cases are. So, uh, but we know the right people, so mm -hmm. we can we can direct uh, we can direct you in the right direction, if even you. if we can't help uh, directly. Yeah. In the, I was going look. I thought I was going to look up, and Ian's going, "Don't send them elsewhere." Did it once. I thought you were going to be prepared to be like, "Don't send them elsewhere." <laughs> <laughs> it's all about logistics. <laughs> uh, so I've got a question. No, no, you recovered quite well. Yeah, that's right. right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I thought it just glazed over. I thought it was finished. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's all got a bit complicated. <laughs> uh, so I've got a question from Midlands Mate. Um, he says, if I sell a car online to someone who pays for it over the phone, are there any dangers to me as a selling dealer? I've read in places like the Car Dealer Forum that there is, but I'm not sure. Someone mentioned about distance selling regulations. Does that count? Distance selling. Yeah, that's coming up all the time now, distance okay. selling issues. Because a lot of people have got websites, people mm. are buying... Um, through a website, ringing up, I'll have that car, making the deal over the phone, and the dealers are delivering it to the person. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of it going on where people are delivering to Scotland for some reason. You know, oh, really? If, yeah, if people are down in the south <laughs> and it's gone to Scotland, that's a big gap to sort things out, but it, yeah. it happens a lot and dealers will do it. Um, but you are going to run the risk that that will be a distant sale, and if it is a distant sale, there are rules about paperwork that you have to give to the client, you have to give them a cancellation form. The client doesn't have to use the cancellation form to cancel the order, right. but you have to give them okay. a cancellation form and you have to tell them they have cancellation rights and those rights are that they have 14 days to change their mind and that can be for, for any or, or no reason. Um, but then we have arguments about what is a distant sale because there was a distant sale regulations in 2000. They were updated in 2013 mm. by the Consumer Contracts Regulations. And in there, it defines a distant sale as a sale exclusively by non-face-to-face -face means of phone, internet, okay. fax, whatever. Um, but is made under what's called an organised distant sale scheme. But the problem with those regulations, it doesn't say what an organised distant sale scheme is. Right. Um, and if you look back from sort of 2000 onwards and the Department of Trade and Industry, as it was guidance they were putting out, even they said they're not defined um, and a one-off is okay. Mm. So if someone rings up and you do it as a favour almost to that client to help them out and, and deliver it, that's not going to be a distant sale. But the dealer then has to work out how many one-offs then make it into a scheme. Right. Okay. There's no case law. It's not been tested. The new regulations in 2013 didn't tighten that up at all, so we're no wiser in the 2013 regulations than we were in the 2000 regulations from there. Okay. So generally speaking, we'd say that's fine if it's a one-off, but if you're doing that two, three times a week, mm. then trading standards might get a sniff of that and think, well, that's not a one-off, that's a scheme. And then at that you're stage, right. yeah, you've got to give, start giving all the paperwork because if you don't give them the paperwork and don't tell them they have 14 days to change their mind, that 14-day window extends by a year. So the customer then has a year and 14 days to change their mind and bring the car back okay. again for no reason whatsoever other than they've Listen, just changed I've, their mind. I've seen this thread on the Car Dealer Forum and it is the flip side of this argument that someone's asking. They've said, um, if I've sold a car completely over the phone and I've delivered it to the customer, do they then only have 14 days to reject it rather than the usual 28-30? Yeah, because the Consumer Rights yeah. Act will give them, well, it could give them up to six years really under contract yeah. law, but generally the first 30 days they yeah. can sort of reject it. Well, we say it relatively easily, but we fight most of those rejections <laughs> off. So really. you guys. Consum yeah, consumers <laughs> think they can reject it relatively easily, but yeah. they, have to they, prove that they there don't. Was a fault. There was a fault. It didn't. And it, it, had to be it there. was a big enough fault not to make it of satisfactory quality. On the, on the right. Of yeah. So the type of sale. So that thirty-day thing is a whole different argument. The fourteen-day distant selling. There doesn't have to be anything wrong with it. They, they can just simply. It. Oh, okay. I mean, basically, they can simply change their I mind. mean, basically, they are literally the change of mind regulations. Okay. Yeah. That's the way we think yeah. of them, the change yeah. of mind regulations, yeah. which is wholly different to what they may get under the Consumer Rights Act, mm. which yeah. is if they've had something that's defective. So similar to you like if, you, if you, you bought clothes in a shop and went back and said, I just don't fancy it anymore, yeah. and it's in the same condition. Mm. Right, okay. Yeah, you can. I mean, if well, they... It's quite different because when you're in the shop, you're there making... You're not, it's not a distant sale. But if yeah, you buy them, for example, uh, uh, um, over the internet, over the internet. Yeah. That's, that's different. That's exactly... 
Yeah, you'll get things selling that. is all about. Yeah. Amazon, John Lewis. But we're not yeah. talking about a pair of trousers here. We're talking no, about a car. Some of these cars can be pretty expensive, yeah. and, and to get them from one place to another can be very, very mm. expensive. So yeah. it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a problem sometimes. Yeah. I mean, normally we can argue off and say, well, it was a one off, and a lot of the time it is. Mm. But if you're going to be coming to us all the time as a dealer saying, oh, I've done this, this is a one-off, this is a one-off, this is a one-off, there comes a stage where it's, it's no longer a one-off one off. Yeah. and yeah. you have to make that decision and then you have to have all the paperwork in place as well. So where do you, is this like um, paperwork that is in a set way or is it something that people can draw up themselves? They can. It's in the consumer contracts regulations. There are schedules in there. And I think, in fact, our website, there's um, some checklists that I drew up. Because the consumer contract regulations, they deal with on-premises sales, so sales in the showroom, off-premises, which is essentially going to someone's house and concluding the sale at right. their house, and distant sales, which phones, blah, blah, mm. come under from there. And we've got a checklist, I think, they're on there somewhere. Yep. I don't know whereabouts they are. Ian put them on there, so they could be no, anywhere. Yeah, it could be anywhere. <laughs> I think consum consumers, though, have been given the, the idea that they are king mm. and that for any reason, at any time, they can just back the car. And some of the, some of the reasons that are coming across our desk and, and these guys' desk are just ludicrous because they are being given incorrect information either by training <coughs> standards or by cab or by anyone or off the internet. Um, so it doesn't make these guys' job uh, any easier. Mm. Um, and really, I think that, that, that we are defending the rights or, or looking after ensuring that our members don't fall into the trap of just rolling over at every little for every little this and that and that is a big thing some of the reasons are just laughable absolutely well, laughable we've had um, i mean i can give two examples of laughable ones we've had someone saying i want to reject the car because i can't get a radio station on my radio yeah and another one who's actually suing on the basis that they thought hpi clean She's complaining that it wasn't clean enough inside the car. It was a bit dirty. Oh, really? She said, well, you described it as HPI clean. I thought that meant it was going to be valeted inside. <laughs> oh. What do you think needs to change, then? The law. Oh, really? Yeah. That's actually, we've had a question that says, how far-sighted is the law in the consumer's favour? I think <laughs> so the well, to feed in. Well, I, think, like, well, no. I, think, I think the difficulty is this, that when it comes to cars, I think there should be a separate piece within the, mm -hmm. within the yeah. Consumer Rights Act that talks specifically about cars. Mm -hmm. Because a car comprises you know, hundreds and thousands of pieces of components and electrics. You, know, you can't compare that to you know, a, a table mm -hmm. or a pair of trousers. It's wholly different. And let's face it, you, know, you, don't, buy, you don't tend to buy many washing machines that are 13 years old. Yeah. You do buy lots of cars that are 13 years old and have mm -hmm. done 120,000 miles on the clock. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to try and sort of uh, compare one uh, with, with the other, uh, but unfortunately the Consumer Rights Act and before that the Sale of Goods Act tend to mesh them all together and there should be one specifically, we think, I feel anyway, uh, just for second-hand cars because it's so unique. Better education for the consumers groups as well because mm. the, 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 you, there's a lottery with what you, they're, they're being told by the trading standards and, and cab all mm. over the country. The, the, the information that's being given out is not uniform. Um, so I think that that needs to change as well. Mm. And of course, and of course, uh, to be fair to the advisor, the CAB or trade standards, they can only the, advise absolutely. based on yeah. what the consumer tells them. Yeah. Uh, which is usually um, missing out some things that they don't want to disclose. Yeah. There's, so, a, there's a tendency mm. that, that people only hear what they want to hear mm. <laughs> as well. So you know they they will they will disregard anything that's not favourable to them and, and yeah. only focus upon uh, the 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 advantageous. Yeah. Point, points that have been that have been put to them. I think I talked about this case with Nona before, and I wrote about it in my column and got a bit ranty. That um, where a guy thought that his Vauxhall Sigma or something was it was all the dealership's fault that everything had gone wrong on it. And I do, at the end of the day, feel sorry for that person. He feels they need to fight a cause for a year as well. And but trading standards turn around and go, oh yes, it's your the case is all good. We'll we'll help you out. Mm. Yeah, it's advice organisations <laughs> tend to look at the headlines of the law, yeah. where mm. what we do is look at the subtle nuances and the twists and turns, and that's what we're very good at. Mm. And that's why we can argue most of the cases, whereas consumer organisations 
you know, a lot of them are volunteers. They just don't have the time to have the level of training that, that we've all got in these things. So they yeah. are just reading from the screen. I think we've talked about this yeah. before, haven't we? You know, and they've got, oh, there's a fault with the car. Great, you've got 30 days to return it. Mm. So that, they're full of hope and expectations when it comes into us and hits oh, our what, desk. And they the consumer wants to hear anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're preaching to the converted, aren't they, by saying, by saying yeah. these, Absolutely. Things, these things to them. Yeah, then we of course, when, when they come to us, they get told something rather different. So... Mm. <laughs> Uh, and they don't always believe what we say, of course. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, we're, we're not anti-consumer, no. but we're pro-trader. Yeah. The, the, you know, mm. these traders are just trying to earn a crust. So, you know, we see it very much as, as we're protecting their rights within the law, just as the consumers have all these groups that are touting for, for, to support them and giving them information. We see it as our job as making sure that the traders aren't getting a rough deal. Mm. Correct. It's the case that... Over expectation is obviously the biggest issue. People want to pay bigger money and get champagne car. Right. And that's what it boils down to ultimately. It's good advice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you get what you pay for. Yeah. Um, which sort of leads nicely onto this question. I've had um, a question from Umesh, um, who has put in a query about you may have seen the system that um, car gurus and auto trader um, offer, saying that there's a best, something's a best buy or a good buy. Um, and he sent me a couple of examples, which obviously you can't see, but um, his query is in the case where the website tells the consumer that something is a good price, and actually if you look into the nitty gritty, it's not, might not be, it says there's one previous owner, but actually it's done X amount of miles more than the other one, which has had three and things like that. Um, could this be construed as mis-selling? Unlikely, uh, okay. because, of this, because of the description of good buy or best mm. value, it's too vague. Right. You know, it's like when you go to the supermarket and they say, you know, best value, manager special, yeah. it's all advertising puff. I mean, what is good value to one person may be not good value to someone else. It depends what you're looking at. Mm. I mean, if you take it in the simplest format, if I produce now two pens, exactly the <laughs> same, one with hardly any ink in it and one with lots of ink in it, at the same price, you'd probably think that the one with the full ink in it is going to be the better value. But actually, if the one with hardly any ink in it is being sold by a world-famous author to a collector, mm -hmm. that's better value than the bog-standard you know, pen with a lot of ink in it. So what's better, better for one person is not the same for someone else. So when you have things like best value, good buys, this, that and the other, it's advertising puff, it's too vague, and it just depends on what the person's looking for. So it's unlikely to get home on misleading advertising on that description. That right. Omesh one was there was uh, it was identical cars, wasn't it? And one was yeah. cheaper, but the the whole history and the whole background of it was slightly mm. wouldn't be seen as good as the other one, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so so that there you're, you're looking at well, what's what is the best value? Just because it's five hundred pounds cheaper doesn't make it a better buy than the one that's five hundred pounds more expensive. Because mm. that in that example might have been the better buy because everything was right with it. Everything yeah. was legit, the history, the ownership documents, that might be the better way to go. So it's just about the consumer really needs to take the time, not look at the price, Yeah. look at the, the, the buyers on a whole. Mm. I can't understand what you're saying because you, you put best value on something and you think, oh, I'll look at that one. But it doesn't mean that you're going to go... It doesn't, it doesn't say buy this one, does yeah, it? Yeah, no. just based on yeah. price, it might, it, might, it might not be the best value at the end of the day. So you have to look at the whole ad and take your time mm. rather than just jumping in because it's £500 cheaper, I'll have that one. Because mm. again, chances are it may well not be the yeah. better buy. Definitely. But it might be for someone else. Yeah. yeah. But if you can add up, if you can count, <laughs> then, then you'd know which one was the cheaper. And if, if all you're interested in was the cheapest, the yeah. then put in a, a monocle to it like, best value mm. is meaningless, yeah. essentially, isn't it? Mm. As, as Jason and, and Ian say, you've got to look at other factors to work out whether that's for you, whether that's best value for you, and yeah. what you actually want. I just, yeah, I hope that customers do do that. I like to think that all you customers think you, you, you would. You would you <laughs> hope so. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. Um, so a fitting question to sort of finish with for the programme. Um, what is the correct way to use trade plates? Well, I think the laws have changed recently, um, according to some stuff on the car dealer forum. I don't know if any of you guys can shed well, a bit of light. Well, uh, um, I haven't seen anything recently concerning mm. it, but uh, I, 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 as far as I'm aware, that trade plates should really only be used for certain purposes, certain business purposes. Mm. Um, 
and uh, ordinarily for a motor trader for example that would involve um, uh, 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 having the vehicle perhaps valeted, taking it to, to, to a, a valeter, mm. um, taking it to a repairer, um, uh, taking customers out for test drives, taking it for an MOT mm. uh, or some other um, uh, authorised uh, inspection of some description. Um, the vehicle would not normally be used by the trader for any other purpose other than, well, it's not being used for the trade by any purpose at all. It's in stock. It's for it's there to be sold. Um, so that would be the, the the only base upon which trade plate should probably be used by a motor trader. Mm. If we were talking about um, uh, if we were talking about someone like a service centre, then um, uh, they would use trade plates for, again for testing mm. purposes and for possibly taking a vehicle to an MOT centre or a Weybridge or something of that nature. Possibly, um, so they're not really supposed to be using the trade plates for other things like mm. going on jollies or you know for a day out to the seaside or to the races or something. You can't just put trade plates in the window and go down. To, so you mean to on our bangers for Ben car, yeah. we were just going to put trade plates in the window and that's not okay. We're not really doing that. <laughs> and, and it's no defence if your plate falls off. Oh, okay. if, you're, if you're driving along, it has to be visible, it, doesn't it? It's the regulation so it tells you where it has to be positioned yeah, yeah, on the yeah. vehicle as well. Yeah. So if you've put it on and it's fallen off on the motorway, and you go caught on a camera, you use no defence to say because the regulations specify where it must be placed as well. Right. I mean, so I've I've had some cases in the past where people have put uh, a trade plate on the front seat. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? yeah. Nobody can see that. Yeah. Well, they're not likely so that to be able to see it. Certainly so no I was going to ask about camera. if they're okay in like, the front window. Not well, well, that's quite common. On the seat seems well, to. They do, they do tend to do that quite often. But again, you'd have to look at the individual mm. car, oh, okay. I suppose, to see if that works. Yeah. See if it's visible. It's got to be visible. Right. Uh, that, that's, that's the key. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have seen myself, personally, mm. abuse of use of trade plates. And um, it's not clever. It it car be, dealer conference, in fact, be. wasn't it? In the car dealer conference. seen about a dozen cars that have trade plates in the window. <laughs> That's a legitimate business purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, problem, the problem with doing that is if you're parked in, in, in car parks. Yeah. Like you, at Tesco. You can't, you can't possibly argue <laughs> yeah. that you're taking that vehicle for a, to, to be tested, mm. that you're taking somebody out for a test drive in it, mm. or anything like that. In fact, it, usually if it's parked anywhere other than. Does that become a land. criminal offence because you're breaking a card? It door? would be deemed to be a regulatory offence. Uh, okay. It would be a breach of the licence, wouldn't it? And you, you, I mean, you're not going to get a criminal have. record for it, but it would okay. be an offence which you could get a fine for. <laughs> mm. Okay. So not worth messing around with your trade plate. Not really. <laughs> so, Ian, are you excited for the weekend? Absolutely. You know that. You so, think that's Twitter feed. We're yeah. blowing it up. <laughs> So everyone needs to... Not literally, I hope. Yeah, oh, no, no, I get it. 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 So you're feeling a little bit more confident than... Oh, with this car? Yeah. Yeah, you've seen the car. Yeah, I've seen the car yeah, now. Yeah, We're going yeah, to yeah. be revealing it later, hopefully. Yep. If no, no, very excited. And it's yeah. a good cause. And it's... Although it's... This lot would like to think it's just a jolly for us. It is hard work. It is hard work. Very hard work. Yeah. 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 Sales went last year. Sales going this year. Legal. Yeah. Sales, sales in the world. Work the work. It's yeah. a sales and marketing opportunity, yeah. guys. Come on. Yeah. I don't come down and oh, talk. I, 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 think, I think what the viewers really want to see is sales and legal mixing it up we next year. Yeah, this, yes. yeah, have, having a sort of, you know... I'd love to see a legal advisor car. Yeah, 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 that'd be yeah. great. We have, we have, With all we of us in it. Yeah, yeah, all, all, all eight of us yeah. in the car. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is we can't, we can't unchain them from well, their desks for long enough. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's not joking about that. No, no, no. 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 We, we are sh shackled here now, in fact. Um, so, if people want to sponsor you quickly before the end, yeah, I would. It'd be nice, yeah, because I think we're only standing at about twenty pound, and tenor of that was from Giles Usher. Thank you, um. Giles. <laughs> um, so it is text L A W G ninety four to seven hundred seventy seven double zero. It's like 70. being on children in need, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Done. It is. we've got to raise it. Twenty pound is pretty rubbish. Come on, guys. Please. <laughs> um, and for anyone who doesn't know, we're going to be going on Banks of Ben on. Friday, we are well, we're going to Dover on yep. Friday. We leave on Saturday morning, driving to the Ferrari factory yep. and then driving back again. 
That sounds great, doesn't it? Hard life, isn't it? That's not hard life. That's really 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 hard life. We have to wine and dine potential clients all weekend. Oh, you're buying the drink? It happened next year. Oh, brilliant. No, I've got I've got two bottles of Zambuca in my luggage allowance. That's it. Oh, we might give the game away a bit. Um... So if you want to sponsor the guys or any of the other teams, uh, head over to the Cardiff Twitter feed or head over to the Logistics Twitter feeds, any of them, um, and we'll share them on trade plates after the show, um, all the different ways to sponsor. Uh, thank you guys for watching today. Thank you all for joining us and for taking the time out. It was very, very interesting. Um, and we will see you again soon. Thank you.